Hi Horse Rampage, Robert Irvin Howard, I got a letter from Aunt Sarah Goza Grimes the other day which said, Dear Breckenridge, I believe time is softening your cousin Bearfield Buckner's feelings toward you. He was over here to supper the other night just after he shot the three Evans boys, and he was in the best humor I seen him in since he got back from Colorado. So I just kind of casually mentioned you and he didn't turn near as purple as he used to every time he heard your name mentioned. He just kind of got a little green around the years, and that might have been on account of him choking on the bar meat he was eating. And all he said was he was going to beat your brains out with a post oak mall if he ever catched up with you, which is the mildest remark he's made about you since he got back to Texas. I believe he's practically give up the idea of sculping you alive and leaving you on the prairie for the buzzards with both legs broke like he used to swear was his sole ambition. I believe in a year or so it would be safe for you to meet dear cousin Bearfield, and if you do have to shoot him, I hope you'll be broad-minded and shoot him in some place which ain't vital because after all you know it was your fault to begin with. We air all well and nothing's happened to speak of except Joe Allison got arm broke Argy in politics with cousin Bearfield. Hoping you air the same. I begs to remain, your loving Aunt Sarah Goza, it's heartening to know a man's kin is thinking kindly of him and forgetting petty grudges. But I can see that Bearfield has been misrepresenting things and pisoning Aunt Sarah Goza's mind and me, otherwise she wouldn't have made the there remark about it being my fault. All fair-minded men knows that what happened warned my fault that is all except Bearfield, and he's naturally prejudiced, because most of it happened to him. I knowed Bearfield was somewheres in Colorado when I joined up with old man Brand Mulholland to make a cattle drive from the Pacos to the Platte, but that didn't have nothing to do with it. I expects to run into Bearfield almost any place where the liquor is red and the shotguns is sword offs. He's a liar when he says I come into the high horse country a purpose to wreck his life and ruin his career, everything I done to him was in kindness and kindredly affection. But he ain't got no gratitude. When I think of the javelin meat I had and the barefooted bandits I had to associate with whilst living in old Mexico to avoid having to kill that worthless critter, his present attitude embitters me, I never had no notion of visiting High Horse in the first place. But we run out of grub a few miles north of there, so what does old man Mulholland do but trout me out to my blankets before daylight, and says, I want you to take the chuck wagon to High Horse and buy some grub. Here's fifty bucks. If you spends a penny of it for anything but bacon, beans, flour, salt and coffee, I'll have your life, big as you be, won't you send the cook? I demanded, he's laying helpless in a chaparral thicket reeking with the fumes of veneer extract, said old man Mulholland. Anyway, you're responsible for this famine. But for your inhuman appetite we'd have had enough grub to last the whole drive. Get going. You're the only man in the string I trust with money and I don't trust you no further and I can heave a bull by the tail. Our Selkinses is sensitive about such remarks, but old man Mulholland was born with a conviction that everybody is out to swindle him, so I maintained a dignified silence outside of telling him to go to hell, and harnessed the mules to the chuck wagon and headed for Antioch. I led Cap Kid behind the wagon because I knowed if I left him unguarded he'd kill every he hoss in the camp before I got back, well, just as I come to the forks where the trail to Gallagher splits off of the high horse road, I heard somebody behind me thumping a banjo and singing, oh. Nora he did build the ark. So I pulled up and pretty soon around the bend come the dirndest looking rig I'd saw since the circus come to war paint. It was a buggy all painted red, white and blue and drawed by a couple of wall-eyed pintos. And there was a fella in it with a long-tailed coat and a plug hat and fancy checked vest, and a cross-eyed nigger playing a banjo, with a monkey setting on his shoulder. The white man taken off his plug hat and made me a bow, and says, Greetings, my master Donock friend. Can you inform me which of these roads leads to the fair city of High Horse? That's led in south, I says. T'other and goes east to Gallego. Air you all part of a circus, I resents the implication, says he. In me you behold the greatest friend to humanity since the inventor of corn liquor. I am Professor Horace J. Latimer, inventor and sole distributor of the boon to suffering humanity, Latimer's lenative loco elixir, good for man or beast. He then histed a jug out from under the seat and showed it to me and a young fellow which had just rode up along the road from Gallego, a sure cure, says he. Have you a hot which has nibbled the seductive loco wheat? That huge brute you've got tied to the end gate that looks remarkable wild in his eye, now, he ain't loco, I says. He's just bloodthirsty, then I bid you both a very good day, sirs, says he. I must be on my way to allay the sufferings of mankind. I trust we shall meet in high horse, so he drove on and I started to cluck to the mules, when the young fella from Gallego, which had been earing me very close, 
he says, ain't you Breckenridge Elkins, when I says I was, he says with some bitterness, that the professor don't have to go to high horse to find loco critters. There's a man in Gallagher right now, crazy as a bedbug your own cousin, Barefield Buckner, what? says I with a villain start, because they hadn't never been no insanity in the family before, only Barefield's great granduncle Esau who once voted Agan Hickory Jackson. But he recovered before the next election, it's the truth, says the young fella. He's sufferin' from a hallucination that he's going to marry a gal over to high horse by the name of Ann Wilkins. They ain't even no gal by that name there. He was having a fit in the saloon when I left, me not bearin' to look on the ruins of Aunt's noble character. I'm feared he'll do hisself a injury if he ain't restrained, hell's fire. I said in great agitation. Is this the truth, true as my name's Lim Campbell, he declared. I thought bin as how you were a relation of his'n, if you could kinda get him out to my cabin a few miles south of Gallego, and keep him there a few days maybe he might get his mind back, I'll do better than that, I says, jumping out of the wagon and tying the mules. Follow me, I says, forking camp kid. The professor's buggy was just going out of sight around a bend, and I lit out after it. I was well ahead of Lim Campbell when I overtaken it. I pulled up beside it in a cloud of dust and demanded, you say that stuff cures man or beast, absolutely. Declared Latimer, well, turn around and head for Gallego, I said. I got you a patient, but Gallego is but a small inn and village he demurs. There is a railroad and many saloons at High Horse and, with a human reason at stake you sets and maunders about railroads. I roared, drawing a point four five and impulsively shooting a few buttons off of his coat. I buys your whole load of loco liquor. Turn around and head for Gallego. I wouldn't think of arguing, says he, turning pale. Meshach, don't you hear the gentleman? Get out from under that seat and turn these horses around, yes, sir, says Meshach, and they swung around it just as Lamb Campbell galloped up. I hauled out the wad old man Mulholland gimme and says to him, Take this dough on to high horse and buy some grub and have it sent out to old man Mulholland's cow camp on the little Yankton. I'm going to Gallego and I'll need the wagon to lug cousin Bearfield in, I'll take the grub out myself, he declared, grabbing the wad. I knowed I could depend on you as soon as I seen you, so he told me how to get to his cabin, and then lit out for high horse and I headed back up the trail. When I passed the buggy I hollered, follow me into Gallego. One of you drive the chuck wagon which is standing at the forks and don't try to shake me as soon as I get out of sight, neither, I wouldn't think of such a thing, says Latimer with a slight shudder. Go ahead and fear not. We'll follow you as fast as we can, so I dusted the trail for Gallego. It warn't much of a town, with only just one saloon, and as I rode in I heard a bella in the saloon and the door flew open and three or four fellows come sailing out on their heads and picked themselves up and tore out up the street. Yes, I says to myself, Cousin Bearfield is in town, all right. Gallego looked about like any town does when Bearfield is celebrating. The stores had their doors locked and the shutters up, nobody was on the streets, and off down across the flat I seen a man which I taken to be the sheriff spurring his horse for the hills. I tied Cam Kid to the hitch rail and as I approached the saloon I nearly fell over a fellow which was crawling around on his all fours with a bartender's apron on and both eyes swelled shut, don't shoot, says he. I gave up, what happened? I asked. The last thing I remember is telling a fella named Buckner that the Democratic platform was silly, says he. Then I think the roof must have fell in or something. Surely one man couldn't have did all this to me, you don't know my cousin Bearfield, I assured him as I stepped over him and went through the door which was tore off its hinges. I'd begun to think that maybe Lamb Campbell had exaggerated about Bearfield, he seemed to be acting in just his ordinary normal manner. But instant later I changed my mind, Bearfield was standing at the bar in solitary grandeur pouring herself a drink, and he was wearing the damnedest looking red, yellow, green and purple shirt ever I seen in my life. What, I demanded in horror, is that thing you got on, if you are referring to my shirt, he retorted with irritation, it's the classiest piece of goods I could find in Denver. I bought it special for my wedding, it's true. I moaned. He's crazy as hell, I knowed no sane man would wear a shirt like that, what's crazy about getting married? He snarled biting the neck off of a bottle and taking a big snort. Folks does it every day, I walked around him cautious, sizing him up and down, which seemed to exasperate him considerable, what the hell's the matter with you? He roared, hitching his harness for Ud. I got a good mind to, be calm, cousin Bearfield, I soothed him. Who's this gal you imagine you are going to marry? I don't imagine nothing about it, you ignorant ape, he retorts cantankerously. 
Her name's Anne Wilkins and she lives in High Horse. I'm riding over the right away and we gets hitched today. I shaken my head mournful and said, you must have inherited this from your great grand uncle Esau. Paps always said Esau's insanity might crop out in the Buckners again some time. But don't worry. Esau was cured and voted a straight democratic ticket the rest of his life. You can be cured too, Bearfield, and I'm here to do it. Come with me, Bearfield, I says, getting a good wrestling grip on his neck, concern it, says cousin Bearfield, and went into action. We went to the floor together and started rolling in the general direction of the back door and every time he come up on top he'd bang my head ache and the floor which soon became very irksome. However, about the tenth revolution I come up on top and pried my thumb out of his teeth and said, Bearfield, I don't want to have to use force with you, but ulp. That was account of him kicking me in the back of the neck. My motives was of the loftiest, and they warned no use in the saloon owner belly aching the way he done afterwards. Was it my fault if Bearfield missed me with a five-gallon damage on and busted the mirror behind the bar? Could I help it if Bearfield wrecked the billiard table when I knocked him through it? As for the stove which got busted, all I got to say is that self-preservation is the first law of nature. If I hadn't hit Bearfield with the stove he would have undoubtedly scrambled my features with that busted beer mug he was trying to use like brass knucks. I've heard maniacs fight awful, but I don't know as Bearfield fit any different than usual. He hadn't forgot his old trick of hooking his spur in my neck whilst we was rolling around on the floor, and when he knocked me down with a roulette wheel and started jumping on me with both feet I thought for a minute I was going to weaken. But the shame of having a maniac in the family revived me and I throwed him off and riz and tore up a section of the brass footrail and wrapped it around his head. Cousin Bearfield dropped the bowie he'd just drawed, and collapsed. I wiped the blood off of my face and discovered I could still see out of one eye. I pried the brass rail off of Cousin Bearfield's head and dragged him out onto the porch by a hind leg, just as Professor Latimer drove up in his buggy. Meshach was behind him in the chuck wagon with the monkey, and his eyes was as big and white as saucers. Where's the patient? asked Latimer, and I said, this here's him. Throw me a rope out of that wagon. We takes him to Lum Campbell's cabin where we can dose him till he recovers his reason. Quite a crowd gathered whilst I was tying him up and I don't believe Cousin Bearfield had many friends in Gallego by the remarks they made. When I lifted his limp carcass up into the wagon one of them asked me if I was a law. And when I said I warn't, pretty short, he says to the crowd, why, hell, then, boys, what's to keep us from paying Buckner back for all the lickings he's give us? I tell you, it's our chance. He's unconscious and tied up, and this here feller ain't no sheriff, get a rope. Howled somebody. We'll hang em, they begun to surge forwards and Latimer and Meshach were so scared they couldn't hardly hold the lines. But I mounted my horse and pulled my pistols and says, Meshach, swing that chuck wagon and head south. Professor, you follow him. Hey, you, get away from the mules. One of the crowd had tried to grab their bridles and stop him, so I shot a heel off in his boot and he fell down hollering bloody murder, get out of the way. I bellowed, swinging my pistols on the crowd, and they give back in a hurry. Get going, I says firing some shots under the mule's feet to encourage em, and the chuck wagon went out of Gallagher jumping and bouncing with Meshach holding onto the seat and hollering blue ruin, and the professor come right behind it in his buggy. I followed the professor looking back to see nobody didn't shoot me in the back, because several men had drawed their pistols. But nobody fired till I was out of good pistol range. Then somebody let loose with a buffalo rifle, but he missed me by at least a foot, so I paid no attention to it, and we were soon out of sight of the town. I was afeard Bearfield might come to and scare the mules with his bellering, but that brass rail must have been harder than I thought. He was still unconscious when we pulled up to the cabin which stood in a little wooded cove amongst the hills a few miles south of Gallego. I told Meshach to unhitch the mules and turn em into the corral whilst I carried Bearfield into the cabin and laid him on a bunk. I told Latimer to bring in all the elixir he had, and he brung ten gallons in one gallon jugs. I give him all the money I had to pay for it. Pretty soon Bearfield come to and he raised his head and looked at Professor Latimer setting on the bunk opposite him in his long-tailed coat and plug hat, the cross-eyed nigger and the monkey setting beside him. Bearfield batted his eyes and says, my god, I must be crazy. That can't be real, sure, you're crazy, cousin Bearfield, I soothed him. But don't worry. We're going to cure you, Bearfield here interrupted me with a yell that turned Meshach the color of a fish's belly, untie me, you son of perdition. He roared, heaving and flopping on the bunk like a python with a bellyache, straining Aegon his ropes till the veins knotted blue on his temples. 
I ought to be in high horse right now gettin' married, see there? I sighed to Latimer. It's a sad case. We better start dosin' him right away. Get a drench in horn. What size dose do you give, a quart at a shirt for a hoss? He says doubtfully. But, we'll start out with that, I says. We can increase the size of the dose if we need to, ignoring Bearfield's terrible remarks I was just twisting the cork out of a jug when I heard somebody say, what the hell are you doing in my shack? I turned around and seen a bow-legged critter with drooping whiskers glaring at me kinda pop-eyed from the door. What you mean, your shack? I demanded, irritated at the interruption. This shack belongs to a friend of mine which has lent it to us, you are drunk or crazy, says he, clutching at his whiskers convulsively. Will you get out peaceable or does I have to get a villain? Oh, a cussed claim jumper, hey? I snorted, taken his gun away from him when he drawed it. But he pulled a bowie so I throwed him out of the shack and shot into the dust around him a few times just for warning, I'll get even with you, you big lummox. He howled, as he ran for a scrawny looking sorrel he had tied to the fence. I'll fix you yet, he promised bloodthirstily as he galloped off, shaking his fist at me, who do you suppose he was? Wondered Latimer, kinda shaky, and I says, what the hell does it matter? Fugit the incident and help me give cousin Bearfield his medicine, that was easier said than did. Tied up as he was, it was all we could do to get that there elixir down him. I thought I never would get his jaws pried open, using the poker for a lever, but when he opened his mouth to cuss me, we jammed the horn in before he could close it. He left the marks of his teeth so deep on that horn it looked like it had been in a bar trap. He kept on heaving and kicking till we'd poured a full dose down him and then he kinda stiffened out and his eyes went glassy. When we taken the horn out his jaws worked but didn't make no sound. But the professor said hosses always acted like that when they'd had a good healthy shot of the remedy, so we left Meshach to watch him, and me and Latimer went out and sat down on the stoop to rest and cool off. Why ain't Meshach unhitched your buggy? I asked, you mean you expect us to stay here overnight? Says he, aghast, overnight, hell. Says I. You stays till he's cured, if it takes a year. You may have to make up some more medicine if this ain't enough. You mean to say we got to wrestle with that maniac three times a day like we just did? Squawked Latimer, maybe he won't be so villant when the remedy takes hold. I encouraged him. Latimer looked like he was going to choke, but just then inside the cabin sounds a yell that even made my hair stand up. Cousin Bearfield had found his voice again. We jumped up and Meshach come out of the cabin so fast he knocked Latimer out into the yard and fell over him. The monkey was right behind him streaking it like his tail was on fire. Oh, lordy yelled Meshach, heading for the tall timber. Dat crazy man am bustin' dem ropes like day was twine. He gwine kill us all, show. I run into the shack and seen cousin Bearfield rolling around on the floor and cussing amazing, even for him. And to my horror I seen he'd busted some of the ropes so his left arm was free. I pounced on it, but for a few minutes all I was able to do was just to hold onto it whilst he throwed me hither and thither around the room with freedom and abandon. At last I kind of wore him down and got his arm tied again just as Latimer run in and done a snake dance all over the floor, Meshach's gone, he howled. He was so scared he ran off with the monkey and my buggy and team. It's all your fault. Being too winded to RGI I just heaved Bearfield up on the bunk and staggered over and sat down on the other one, whilst the professor pranced and whooped and swore I owed him for his buggy and team. Listen, I said when I got my wind back. I spent all my money for that elixir. But when Bearfield recovers his reason he'll be so grateful he'll be glad to pay you himself. Now fidget such sordid trash as money and devote your scientific knowledge to get in Bearfield sane, sane. Howls Bearfield. Is that what you're doing tie in me up and pissing in me? I've tasted some awful muck in my life, but I never dreamt nothing could taste as bad as that stuff you poured down me. It plumb paralyzes a man. Let me loose, damn it, will you be cam if I answers you? I asked, I will. He promised heartily, just as soon as I've festooned the surrounding forest with your entrails, still villant, I said sadly. We better keep him tied, Professor. But I'm due to get married in high horse right now. Bearfield yelled, giving such a convulsive heave that he throwed his self clean off of the bunk. It was his own fault, and they warned no use in him later blaming me because he hit his head on the floor and knocked his self stiff. Well, I said, at least we'll have a few minutes of peace and quiet around here. Help me lift him back on his bunk, what's that? Yelled the professor, jumping convulsively as a rifle cracked out in the brush and a bullet whined through the cabin. That's probably drooping whiskers, I says, lifting cousin Bearfield. I thought I seen a Winchester on his saddle. Say, 
It's getting late. See if you can't find some grub in the kitchen. I'm hungry. Well, the professor had an awful case of the willies, but we found some bacon and bins in the shack and cooked them and ate them, and fed Bearfield, which had come to when he smelt the grub cooking. I don't think Latimer enjoyed his meal much because every time a bullet hit the shack he jumped and choked on his grub. Drooping Whiskers was pretty persistent, but he was so far back in the brush he wasn't doing no damage. He was a rotten shot anyhow. All of his bullets was away too high, as I pinted out to Latimer, but the professor weren't happy, I didn't dare untie Bearfield to let him eat, so I made Latimer set by him and feed him with a knife, and he was scared and shook so he kept spilling hot bins down Bearfield's collar, and Bearfield's language was awful to hear, time we got through it was long past dark, and drooping whiskers had quit shooting at us. As it later appeared, he'd run out of ammunition and gone to borrow some cartridges from a ranch house some miles away. Bearfield had quit cussing us. He just lay there and glared at us with the most horrible expression I ever seen on a human being. It made Latimer's hair stand up, but Bearfield kept working at his ropes and I had to examine him every little while and now and then put some new ones on him. So I told Latimer we better give him another dose, and when we finally got it down him, Latimer staggered into the kitchen and collapsed under the table and I was as near wore out myself as a Elkins can get but I didn't dare sleep for fear cousin Bearfield would get loose and kill me before I could wake up. I sat down on the other bunk and watched him and after while he went to sleep and I could hear the professor snoring out in the kitchen. About midnight I lit a candle and Bearfield woke up and said, Blast your soul, you done woke me up out of the sweetest dream I ever had. I dreamt I was fishing for sharks off Mustang Island, what's sweet about that? I asked, I was using you for bait, he said. Hey, what you doing, it's time for your dose. I said, and then the battle started. This time he got my thumb in his mouth and would undoubtedly have chawed it off if I hadn't kind of stunned him with the iron skillet. Before he could recover his self I had the elixir down him with the aid of Latimer which had been woke up by the racket. How long is this going on? Latimer asked despairingly. Ow, it was drooping whiskers again. This time he'd crawled up pretty close to the house and his first slug combed the professor's hair. I'm a patient man but I've reached my limit, I snarled blowing out the candle and grabbing a shotgun off the wall. Stay here and watch Bearfield whilst I go out and hang drooping whiskers high to the nearest tree. I snuck out of the cabin on the opposite side from where the shot come from, and began to sneak around in a circle through the brush. The moon was coming up, and I knowed I could out-engine drooping whiskers. Any Bear Creek man could. Sure enough, pretty soon I slid around a clump of bushes and seen him bending over behind a thicket whilst he took aim at the cabin with a Winchester. So I emptied both barrels into the seat of his breeches and he gave a most amazing howl and jumped higher than I ever seen a bow-legged fella jump, and dropped his Winchester and taken out up the trail toward the north, I was determined to run him clean off the range this time, so I pursued him and shot at him every now and then, but the darn gun was loaded with bird shot and all the shells I'd grabbed along with it was the same. I never seen a white man run like he did. I never got classed enough to do no real damage to him and after I'd chased him a mile or so he turned off into the brush, and I soon lost him. Well, I made my way back to the road again, and was just fixing to step out of the brush and start down the road toward the cabin, when I heard horses coming from the north. So I stayed behind a bush, and pretty soon a gang of men come around the bend, walking their horses, with the moonlight glinting on Winchesters in their hands. Easy now, says one. The cabin ain't far down the road. We lease up and surround it before they know what's happening. I wonder what that shootin' was we heard a while back? Says another and kind of nervous, maybe they was fighting amongst their selves, says yet another. No matter. We'll rush in and settle the big fella's hash before he knows what's happening. Then we'll string Buckner up, what you reckon they kidnapped Buckner for? Some fella begun. But I waited for no more. I riz up from behind the bushes and the horses snorted and reared, hang a helpless man because he licked you in a fair fight, hey? I bellowed and let go both barrels amongst em. They was riding so clost group don't think I missed any of em. The way they hollered was disgusting to hear. The horses were scared at the flash and roar right in their faces and they wheeled and bolted, and the whole gang went thundering up the road a darn sight faster than they'd come. I sent a few shots after em with my pistols, but they didn't shoot back, and pretty soon the weeping and wailing died away in the distance. A fine mob they turned out to be, but I thought they might come back. So I sat down behind a bush where I could watch the road from Gallego. And the first thing I knowed I went to sleep in spite of myself. When I woke up it was just coming daylight. I jumped up and grabbed my guns, but nobody was in sight. 
I guess them Gallagher gents had got a belly full. So I headed back for the cabin and when I got to the corral was empty and the chuck wagon was gone, I started on a run for the shack and then I seen a note stuck on the corral fence. I grabbed it. It said, Dear Elkins, this train is too much for me. I'm getting white-haired sitting and watching this devil laying the glaring at me, and wondering all the time how soon he'll bust loose. I'm pulling out. I'm taking the chuck wagon and team in payment for my rig that Meshach ran off with. I'm leaving the elixir but I doubt if it'll do Buckner any good. It's for locoed critters, not homicidal maniacs, respectfully yours, Horace J. Latimer, Esquire, Hell's Fire, I said wrathfully, starting for the shack. I don't know how long it had took Bearfield to wriggle out of his ropes. Anyway he was laying for me behind the door with the iron skillet and if the handle hadn't broke off when he landed me over the head with it he might have did me a injury. I don't know how I ever managed to throw him, because he fit like a frothing maniac, and every time he managed to break loose from me he grabbed a jug of Latimer's loco elixir and busted it over my head. By the time I managed to stun him with a table leg he'd busted every jug on the place, the floor was swimming in elixir, and my clothes was soaked in it. Where they wasn't soaked with blood, I fell on him and tied him up again and then sat on a bunk and tried to get my breath back and wondered what in hell to do. Because here the elixir was all gone and I didn't have no way of treating Bearfield and the professor had run off with the chuck wagon so I hadn't no way to get him back to civilization, then all at once I heard a train whistle, away off to the west, and remembered that the track passed through just a few miles to the south. I did all I could for Bearfield, only thing I could do now was to get him back to his folks where they could take care of him. I run out and whistled for Cap'n Kid and he busted out from around the corner of the house where he'd been laying for me and tried to kick me in the belly before I could get ready for him, but I warn't fooled. He's tried that trick too many times. I dodged and gave him a good bust in the nose, and then I throwed the bridle and saddle on him, and brung cousin Bearfield out and throwed him across the saddle and headed south. That must have been the road both Meshach and Latimer taken when they run off. It crossed the railroad track about three miles from the shack. The train had been whistling for high horse when I first heard it. I got to the track before it come into sight. I flagged it and it pulled up and the train crew jumped down and wanted to know what the hell I was stopping them for, I got a man here which needs medical attention, I says. It's a case of temporary insanity. I'm sending him back to Texas, hell, says they, this train don't go nowhere near Texas, well, I says, you unload him a Dodge City. He's got plenty of friends there which will see that he gets took care of. I'll send word from High Horse to his folks in Texas telling them to go after him. So they loaded Cousin Bearfield on, him being still unconscious, and I give a conductor his watch and chain and pistol to pay for his fare. Then I headed along the track for High Horse, when I got to High Horse I tied Cam Kid nigh the track and started for the depot when who should I run smack into but old man Mulholland who immediately gave a howl like a hungry timber wolf, was the grub, you hoss thief? He yelled before I could say nothing, why, didn't Lum Campbell bring it out to you? I asked, I never seen a man by that name, he bellowed. Was my fifty bucks, heck, I says, he looked honest, who? Yowled old man Mulholland. Who, you pull cat, Lim Campbell, the man I give the dough to for him to buy the grub, I says. Oh, well, never mind. I'll work out the fifty. The old man looked like he was fixing to choke. He gurgled, where's my chuck wagon, a fella stole it, I said. But I'll work that out too, you won't work for me, foamed the old man, pulling a gun. You're fired. And as for the dough and the wagon, I takes them out of your hide here and now, well, I taken the gun away from him, of course, and tried to reason with him, but he just hollered that much louder, and got his knife out and made a pass at me. Now it always did irritate me for somebody to stick a knife in me, so I taken it away from him and throwed him into a nearby hoss trough. It was one of these here V-shaped troughs which narrows together at the bottom, and somehow his fool head got wedged and he was about to drown. Quite a crowd had gathered and they tried pulling him out by the hind legs but his feet was waving around in the air so wild that every time anybody tried to grab him they got spurred in the face. So I went over to the trough and taken hold of the sides and tore it apart. He fell out and spit up maybe a gallon of water. And the first words he was able to say he accused me of trying to drown him on purpose, which shows how much gratitude people has got. But a man spoke up and said, hell, the big fella didn't do it on purpose. I was right here and I seen it all. And another one said, I seen it as good as you did, and the big fella did try to drown him, too. Are you calling me a liar? Said the first fella, reaching for his gun, but just then another man chipped in and said, I dunno what the argument's about. 
but I bet a dollar you're both wrong, and then some more fellas butted in and everybody started cussing and hollering till it nigh defend me. Someone else reaches for a gun and I seen that as soon as one fella shoots another there is bound to be trouble so I started to gentle the first fella by hitting him over the head. The next thing I know someone hollers at me, you big hyena, and tries to ruin me with a knife. Pretty soon there is hitting and shooting all over the town. High horse is sure on a rampage, I just had finished blunting my colts on a varmint's head when I thinks disgustedly, heck, Elkins, you came to this town on a mission of goodwill. You got business to do. You got your poor family to think about. I started to go on to the depot but I heard a familiar voice screech above the racket. There he is, Sheriff. Arrest the darn claim jumper. I whirled around quick and there was drooping whiskers, a saddle blanket trapped around him like a engine and walking putty spraddle legged. He was pinting at me and hollering like I did something to him. Everybody else quieted down for a minute, and he hollered, Arrest him, darn him. He throwed me out of my own cabin and ruined my best pants with my own shotgun. I've been to Knife River and come back several days quicker than I aim to, and that this big hyena was in charge of my shack. He was too darn big for me to handle, so I come to high horse after the sheriff soon as I got three or four hundred birds shot picked out my hide. What you got to say about this? Asked the sheriff, kind and uncertain, like he weren't enjoying his jobs for some reason or other. Why, hell, I says disgustedly. I throwed this varmint out of a cabin, sure, and later peppered his anatomy with bird shot. But I was in my rights. I was in a cabin which had been loaned me by a man named Lem Campbell, Lem Campbell shrieked drooping whiskers, jumping up and down so hard he nigh lost the blanket he was wearing instead of breeches. That worthless critter ain't got no cabin. He was working for me till I fired him just before I started for Knife River, for been so trifling, hell's fire. I says, shocked. Ain't there no honesty anymore? Shucks, stranger, it looks like the joke's on me. At this drooping whiskers collapsed into the arms of his friends with a low moan, and the sheriff says to me uncomfortably, don't take this personal. But I'm afeard I'll have to arrest you, if you don't mind. Just then a train whistled away off to the east, and somebody said, What the hell, they ain't no train from the east this time of day. Then the depot agent run out of the depot waving his arms and yelling, Get them cows off in the track. I just got a flash from Knife River, the train's coming back. A maniac named Buckner busted loose and made the crew turn her around at the switch. Orders gone down the line to open the track all the way. She's coming under full head of steam. Nobody knows where Buckner's duck in her. He's looking for some relative of his'n. There was a lot of noise coming down that track and all that went the noise that a steam engine makes by itself. No, that noise was a different noise all right. That noise was right familiar to me. It struck a chord in my mind and made me wonder kinda what happened to them Drayman, can that be Bearfield Buckner? Wondered a woman. It sounds like him. Well, if it is, he's too late to get Ann Wilkins. What? I yelled. Is there a girl in this town named Ann Wilkins? They was, she snickered. She was to marry this Buckner man yesterday, but he never showed up, and when Harold Bow, Lem Campbell, come along with fifty dollars he got some place, she up and married him and they lit out for San Francisco on their honeymoon. Why, what's the matter, young man? You look right green in the face. Maybe it's something you et, it weren't nothing I et. It was the thoughts I was thinking. Here I had gone and ruined Cousin Bearfield's whole future and out of kindness. That's what busted me wide open. I had ruined Cousin Bearfield's future out of kindness. My motives had been of the loftiest, I had tried to cure on nombre what was loco from going loco yet, and what was my reward? What was my reward? Just that moment I looks up and I seen a cloud of smoke a puffin' down the track and there's a roarin' like the roarin' of a herd of catamounts. Here she comes around the bend, yelled somebody. She's burning up the track. Listen at that whistle. Just busting it wide open, but I was already a straddle of can kid and traveling. The man which says I'm scared of Bearfield is a liar. Elkins fears neither man, beast nor Buckner. But I seen that Lem Campbell had worked me into getting Bearfield out of his way, and if I waited till Bearfield got there, I'd have to kill him or get killed, and I didn't crave to do neither, I headed south just to save cousin Bearfield's life, and I didn't stop till I was in Durango. Let me tell you the revolution I got mixed up in there was a plum restful relief after my association with Cousin Bearfield. 